Welcome to the preaching and teaching series of House on the Rock, Lagos, Nigeria. We believe that as you listen to God's Word, you will receive understanding, hope, and faith to become all that God wants you to be. Something is about to happen in your life. And now, here is Pastor Paul and a Pharisee. What's happening to many of us in this room this morning is that we are fighting God instead of clinging to God. And your power, your purpose, your promise, your destiny, your future is never in the fight, it's in the clinging. It's easy to find somebody who loves you enough to embrace you physically, but it's hard to find somebody who loves you enough to wrestle with you. Because to be a good lover, you have to be a good wrestler. And you'll never find a better lover than God because he'll wrestle you till he changes who you are into what he created you to be. He said God has such a powerful purpose and a promise on your life. And that's why he loved you enough to wrestle with you till he broke your leg to let you to know that lean not to your own understanding. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be blessed with a limp than be cursed with a swagger. Get the message today when you visit our media store or online at houseontherock.org.ng. Genesis 27, beginning to read in the King James Version of the Bible from verse 18, reading through to verse 29. It's our custom to stand for the reading of the Word of God. Genesis 27 and verse 18. It speaks of Jacob. And he came unto his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I. Who art thou, my son? And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. I have done according as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison that my soul may bless me, or that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord thy God brought it to me. And Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son whether thou be my very son Esau or, or not. And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not, because his hands were hairy, as his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. And he said, Art thou my very son Esau? And he said, I am. And he said, Bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near to him, and he, he did eat, and brought him wine, and he drank. And his father Isaac said unto him, Come near now, and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his raiment, and blessed him, and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine and let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee and blessed be he that blesseth thee. And it came to pass as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob, and Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from his hunting. My concern is with the 18th, 19th, and 22nd, and 23rd verses. And he came unto his father and said, My father, 
And he said, Here am I. Who art thou, my son? And Jacob said unto his father, He was lying, I am Esau, thy firstborn. I have done according as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison, that thy soul may bless me. Verse 22 and verse 23, And Jacob went near unto Isaac his father and felt him, and, and he felt him as in Isaac felt Jacob and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not. Because his hands were hairy as his brother Esau's hands. And so Isaac blessed Jacob. I was chatting with my wife a few moments ago, in fact from, from earlier this morning. And I, I said, I, I really want to title my thought, The Blessing of God on the Bad Boy. But she told me, she said, I, do, you don't want them to take it for license. And I said to her, no, I don't want them to take it for license to be bad with a blessing. But, but I said, the blessing will make the bad, the bad boy, a good boy or a good man. And so for, for all of you who have antecedents like I do, I want you to know that you are not excluded from the blessing. And I want to talk to you about the blessing of God this morning. Can I have a few moments? Before we do, look for about three or four people, slap them a high five and tell them the blessing is coming on you. Our Father, we honor you this morning and we thank you for the blessing of Abraham that has been made available to us through Jesus Christ and our faith in him. And even so, I ask that in all that is said and done, all that is heard and understood, that the great thing you will do this morning is you will unlock the blessing and outpour it massively on everyone who has faith and deeply believes in spite of all they are going through, that your blessing is un unobscurable and that with you, there is no variableness, nor is there any shadow of turning. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. And the people of God said a very big amen. amen. The blessing of Abraham is very powerful and truly profound. In fact, the word prolific would not be sufficient to describe the power of that blessing. And the reality is that the blessing is an invisible quantity. It's an invisible quality. It's something that you cannot see with the natural eye. However, when the blessing is on somebody, that blessing will produce very visible and tangible results. And they will be sustainable beyond the life and times of the individual that God has chosen to bless. So that when you are blessed, your children your surrogates, biological and otherwise, will not be able to escape the blessing. And to help you understand the blessing, let me quickly refer your attention to the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis, the first, second, and third verse, where God told Abraham, come out from your country, from your father's house, and from your kindred, and go to a land that I will show you, and there I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And then he went on to tell him that I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who curse you, and moreover, I will cause all the families of the earth to be blessed in you. And you'll notice that therein there are eight blessings or eight results of that blessing. The first result is that you will have land and you will not be a tenant in that land. That land will be yours to possess. But in order to possess it, you will have to dispossess the caretakers that God appointed to keep the land until you got there. And because the land is precious, the caretakers are often ferocious, they are strong, and they are often referred to in the Bible as giants. So that nobody else could take the land from them until you showed up with a greater power than the giants had. And that's important to understand, and it should invigorate you to begin to desire to be a landowner. It, oh, that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ would become landowners. And by the church, I don't mean the organized church, I mean the individuals in the church. And secondly, 
He then told Abraham that as a function of that blessing, I will make you great. I will make you a great nation. In other words, I will put such greatness upon you and that greatness will overflow you till you become nationally significant and you will be considered national. You'll be considered uh, uh, multiplied. Beyond that, he also told him, I am going to bless you. I'm going to say something to you that is going to change your life, take you from the back and put you in the front, take you from down under and bring you up over, snatch you from obscurity and bring you to notability. I'm gonna put something on your life that is very, very significant. Not just will I make you give you land and make you a great nation and then bless you I'm also going to give you a great name being great and having a great name are not the same thing Being great is something that often happens in the privacy of your isolation David was great whilst he was killing lions and bears, but when he killed a giant He now had a great name when he killed lions and bears He was a nobody in obscurity and his only audience was a few little sheep from his father's flock there was nobody to serenade or applaud his great capacity, his great strategy, his great ability, and his powerful audacity. But when God took him from the shadows and brought him into the light of the nation, he was transiting him from greatness into a great name. Because of the great thing that he was going to do that was a transgenerational thing, he had to not only have greatness, but also had to have a great name. I pray for you this morning that as the blessing comes upon you, you will not only be blessed, you will not only be a landowner, you will not only be a great person, but you will also have a great name. Please say amen, somebody. And God didn't stop there. He went further and he said, I want you to be focused. I don't want you to be distracted because when greatness comes upon your life and greatness sits down upon you, you're going to attract enemies and friends. A lot of people will want to benefit from the honor, the power, the glory, the wisdom, the wealth, the, the favor that you have, and therefore they're going to come and support you. God says, it's gonna be very difficult for you to reciprocate everybody who helps you. You'll have too many gifts, too many birthday cards, too many friends, too many folk trying to help you and to support you. And because you're a conscientious person who has a friendly heart, you're gonna try to bless everybody back, but you'll burn out trying to bless them back because they're gonna be too many because God's gonna lift you so high. I don't know who I'm talking to today. But God's going to lift you so high that you'll never have enough capacity to bless them back. God says, I'll take care of that for you. I'll bless those who bless you so you don't have to worry about trying to bless them yourself. Just because they help you, I'm going to help them. Just because they think good of you, I'm going to think good of them. Just because they want to push you along, I'm going to push them along. Slap somebody a high five telling you better bless me. But he also said that, that in this blessing, uh, uh, one of the things that he's going to do is he's going to curse those who curse you. In other words, he's going to contend with those who contend against you. He'll fight with those who fight against you. He'll hurt those who try to hurt you so that no weapon fashioned against you will be able to prosper. Because he says, I don't want you distracted from the purpose for which I blessed you. I want you to build nations and build generations coming out of your loins so that I will have a people on the earth who will do the will of God. And I don't want you losing traction from your purpose by turning to try to deal with your enemies every time they try to touch you I'm going to wound them those who try to kill you I'll kill them those who dig a hole for you I'll dig the hole for them and I'll bury them in the hole that I either dog or that they dug for themselves you hear what I'm saying because I don't want you worrying about how to reciprocate the evil doers or the good doers just stay focused. And as long as you stay focused and you walk in the center of my will, which means the center of my power and my purpose, my grace to protect you and to reciprocate your helpers will mightily be upon your life. This is what was called the blessing. And of all the men on the face of the earth, in a place of idolatry called the Ur of the Chaldeans, God's eyes went to and fro, and he saw in the heart of a boy called Abram the willingness to believe God and to trust him and to walk with God. And he snatched him and said, if you will get out of your father's house, if you start thinking outside the box, if you come away from your kindred because they're not thinking on my level, but I perceive you have the ability to think on the level I'm thinking of. And if you come out of your country and you go to a land that I'll show you, I'm going to fix to bless you, boy. Yes, sir. 
You must understand that in Abraham's house, including Abraham, there were a bunch of liars. They were idolaters. They were stargazers. They were necromancers. They were bad boys. God said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. This is, understand for me, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a physical God talking to Abraham. This is an invisible encounter. And this is important for me to begin to underscore because the blessing does not come from the natural. If you gave me money, by the way, you didn't bless me. And if I think that blessing my kids is to give them money, I've missed the point. Because everything that is visible comes from the invisible. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3. By faith, we understand that the worlds, that's the tangible, were framed by the word of God intangible such that the things which do appear were created by the things which do not appear so the invisible creates the visible unfortunately we have such a materialistic generation that's constantly focused on the material but does not understand that the material pro proceeds from the immaterial and that if you keep giving somebody stuff you may be hurting their ability to resource from God I want to get something on your head before I leave here this morning. I'm twisted by mixed feelings because of the bereavements that we suffer as a people. But in the midst of it, you must walk in the blessing. Hear me and hear me carefully. This blessing hit Abraham and it started the process of changing his life massively that all of a sudden he started to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow his livestock grew his sheep grew his lambs grew his cattle grew everything he had grew his children grew his stuff grew his wealth grew his power grew so that there was not one nation or king or people around him that was not subservient or subordinate to him five great kings of the philistines came against him but god's blessing was on him that god fought them for him that abraham barely lifted a hand to fight the blessing was on him everything he touched it turned to gold and Abraham became so wealthy that he became frustrated he said God I have all this wealth but I have no son from my own loins to be my heir and he said you promised me that I would become the father of many nations yet how can I be the father of many nations when I'm not even the father of one and God had been promising him stuff for years and God's promise had not yet come to pass and God now took Abraham to a place and he told him he said I promise to bless you I promise to bless you and when the Almighty God the promise keeper promises to bless you remember he's not a man that he can lie even if he tried to lie it would come out as a truth because there's so much power in him that if he says something it will become whatever he says because of the power in him to make what he says become what he says that's how come he's able to call those things that are not and they become drug addict on the back streets of south miami says my minister and even though he was a drug addict because he called him his minister he had to become what he called him you hear what i'm saying to you God's calling some stuff on you. And no matter what you look like or are like today, by the time he calls you, it's sooner or later you will become what he called you. This invisible God spoke to Abraham and told him that I'm going to bless you. Abraham struggled because he saw much of the result of the blessing, but the thing that was very important to Abraham, I need an heir who will create more heirs or procreate more heirs who will pro procreate more heirs so that we will become this nation he had none he said all i have is eliezer from damascus and he's not my child just a good house boy but he's not from my lawyers god said 
I swear, I'm going to bless you. That's what Genesis 15 reveals. When he told Abraham, I'm going to bless you for the several time over, Abraham said, I'm not just going to take your word. Let's go to the lawyer's office. Let's write out the contract and let's sign it in blood. And they went and took three parted halves of three sacred animals and Abraham planned to walk between the parted house with God, but God put him to sleep, and God walked with God. God the Father, the smoking flax, and God the Son, the burning torch, they cut covenant together, and God the smoking flax was God the Son, a man, pre-incarnate though, because he was foreshadowing something else. What was God doing here? God was simply saying, I swear, I'm going to bless you. I remember when I was an Igubi College boy and somebody wanted your lunch the following day uh, because he gave you his lunch the day before. You had to swear, I'll give you my lunch. And the way you swore was you took your finger, you put it in the soil. And that was to signify if I don't give it to you, I'm going back to the soil. And then you put your finger on your tongue and then you point it to heaven. That if I don't give you my lunch tomorrow, May God take me back to the earth. I swear I give you my lunch. Now when God says, I swear I'm going to bless you, he looks for somebody greater than himself who will hold him accountable to his oath, but he found none. So he said, I swear by myself in these two immutable things, the word, and my life as God, that I will cease to be God and my word will no longer be my word if I don't do what I promise to do in your life. That's why, friends, if you are a child of God in Jesus Christ, you have to recognize, understand, believe, and know, no matter how difficult your circumstances and situations are, that if God said, I bless you, you are blessed. Let me just test it. On a few people here if you are not blessed I want you to sit still or just stay there stitch your two lips together and say nothing hold it hold it hold, hold it listen, listen at me I'm not trying to get you to do that yet if you are not blessed sit still but if you are blessed it's part of the fact that you just lost a loved one it's part of the fact that your money looks funny. It's part of the fact that things don't seem to be working right now. It's part of the fact that all hell is breaking loose in your life. It's part of the fact that the doctor may have just told you that there's a lump in your breast. It's part of the fact that the doctor may have just told you there's prostate or cancer in your prostate. It's part of the fact that one of your children is running crazy and is out there on drugs. It's part of the fact that whilst you're aging and going from 50 to 60 or 60 to 70 or 70 to 80, your body doesn't feel like it is. You still know that the blessing of God is upon you. I want you to shout that three people give them a high five and tell them I'm blessed and there's nothing the devil can do about it. I don't have my car but I'm blessed. I don't own my own house yet but I'm blessed. I have no land with a title deed to my name but I'm blessed. I want to be married but I'm not yet married but I'm blessed. My husband died or my wife died but I'm still blessed. Got a bad doctor's report but it makes no difference. If God says I'm blessed, baby, I am blessed. I'm blessed. That means I'm not cursed. You can try to curse me, but it ain't gonna work. You can voodoo me, hoodoo me, jex me, take a little wax doll of me, stick pins in it, but honey, it ain't gonna work because if God says I'm blessed, baby, I am blessed. And one of the things you have to recognize is that what God has blessed, no man can curse. Because if you try to curse a blessed man, you're only cursing yourself because it's gonna come back to you, oh God. I feel something in this room today. I'm going to contain myself. Sit down. Let me keep talking. I want to keep teaching for a while. So you have to know that you are blessed. You have to know it. You have to understand it, that you're blessed. And the, the, the fact that you are blessed may not immediately correlate with your circumstances and your situation. But I do guarantee you, eventually it will. Eventually, eventually. 
when events become allies with divine purpose divine promise and divine power eventually and some of the events that will bring you into alignment with the fulfillment of God's promised blessing upon your life may not always be nice events it was in the year that King Uzziah died that Isaiah rendezvoused with the Lord it's often some of the bad things that happen that that because there's a blessing on your life God is able to take the bad thing and the blessing now turns it into a good thing I hear St. Paul preaching in my ear we know that all things work together together that means there has to be some togetherness of events that means there has to be some togetherness of some, some troubles some struggles some events in your life and they work together for your bad for your good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose Abraham wasn't arbitrarily called he was called for a purpose ask somebody do you know your purpose and if they don't answer you tell them you need to find out one of the greatest blessings is to know your purpose gives you traction not distraction but traction are you with me I don't know who you are but you're blessed to get married do you know that, that, that there's a blessing that comes upon you to get you married and sometimes that blessing will cause delays otherwise you might marry the wrong person otherwise you might get married prematurely otherwise you might not be ready for it and as a result may not value the whole institution of, of matrimony and its purpose you're blessed to build your house even though there, there are but three zeros in your bank account, just three, to build a house in this country, you're going to need at least six or seven or eight, if not nine. You're blessed to build your house. Oh, let me try my people over here. I don't know about you guys. I said, somebody here, you are blessed to build your house so that some landlord ain't gonna keep knocking on your door threatening you jacking up the prices by the time you paid him rent for 10 years he built two more houses you're blessed and that blessing is not your paycheck it's not the job or career that you work if God says you're blessed everything in your life your job your paycheck your boss they all have to align your enemies your friends the Treasury the bank the economy it all has to align to conform with what God's Word says about you can I tell you something else there's somebody else here you, you you've been struggling with debt for a long time but you're blessed to come out of debt Oh, you ain't listening to me. I'm going to go to some folk who have some real debt. Is there anybody here who's struggling with debt? I want to tell you, there's a blessing. It's called the blessing that God put on that bad boy, Jacob. It's a blessing that came from Abraham or came through Abraham. That blessing will cancel your debt or it will grow you out of debt or it will facilitate you with wealth enough to pay off your debt. I don't know who you are, but if you believe it, child, I'm blessed to come out of debt blessed to get healed blessed to be healthy blessed to be the head and not the tail blessed to be above only and not beneath blessed to come from the back like David and go to the front blessed to come from the prison and end up in the palace like Joseph bless bless when you rise up bless when you sit down bless when you come home bless when you go out bless when you drive the car out of the garage bless when you drive the car back into the garage bless when you go to see your kids bless when you come back bless when you lay down in your bed bless when you sit down in your office who is that person that I'm talking about whilst I was struggling and suffering and failing and feeling defeat I had to know within myself that I'm blessed I'm blessed bless Sammy 
The people of antiquity, they deeply believed in the blessing. So that whether they were friends, companions, colleagues, counselors, in the presence of a man upon whom a great blessing was, they reverenced it. And if they were close to him, they supported, blessed, and helped him because they recognized if you bless somebody who God has blessed, God's going to bless you back. But then the children of a blessed man, they scrambled to be the firstborn or to get the blessing of the firstborn because the father, through speaking invisible words, would transfer the blessing on his life onto normally his firstborn son's life. So there was a huge jostling, jockeying, scrambling, contention to get the blessing of the father. You see it between Cain, who killed Abel, because the favor of God came upon Abel, and Cain became jealous. You see it between Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael wanted it so bad, but his father didn't give him as much blessing. He gave him physical stuff and said a little word to him and said, he too will be a great nation. And they did become a great nation, but not like Israel. <laughs> Manasseh and Ephraim, there was a struggle. Joseph and his 10 older brothers, there was a struggle. David and his oldest brother and his older brothers, there was a struggle. Jacob and Esau, the subject of our text this morning, there was a serious struggle. That struggle begun in the womb. We talked about that and used it as a metaphor a few weeks ago to discuss the contention in you struggling for the birthright or the blessing on you because if the blessing comes on you and Esau takes it Esau is going to use the blessing to do evil he'll use the capacity the competence of the blessing to do evil but hear me my friends when Jacob and Esau contended for the blessing Something happened that was really quite significant. These boys understood and knew the value of the blessing. They knew its worth, they understood its weight. They knew that whoever got the blessing was going to be mighty, was going to be significant, was going to be powerful, would become the head that his siblings, uh, the peoples, the nations would be subservient to him and gladly so because they were blessed by following him. Uh, they, they understood that and so there was a big fight for it. By the way, this blessing was so heavy, so heavy that God chose to surname himself after the man he blessed. So stand up for a moment, sir, if you don't mind. He said, that's Abraham. Abraham came from nowhere and just started prospering and being blessed everywhere. On all sides. Everything he did just kept growing and growing and growing. And God said, I am the God of Abraham. In other words, he said, everything you're seeing in his life, I did it for him. He's my surname on earth. And then Abraham, as far as heaven was concerned, looked at God and told earth that Abraham of God. So heaven recognized Abraham as in covenant with God and earth recognized God as in covenant with Abraham. In other words, everything you see, you see happening in his life, God said, I'm the one who did it for him. He's my advertorial to you that if you get into covenant with me the way he got into covenant with me, if you support him and flow with him the way he flows with me, what I did for him, I'll start doing it for you. When I gave you the seven blessings of Abraham, thank you, I forgot to tell you that one of the blessings on Abraham, I gave you seven, one was land, the other one was a great name, become a great nation or greatness. Another one was you'll be blessed. Another one was that 
um, you'll, you'll have a great name. Another one was that you will, you won't have to fight your enemies, I'll fight them for you. You won't have to uh, support your helpers, I'll support them for you. And, and uh, the other one was that, that, that all the families of the earth will be blessed in you. But moreover, I'm going to make you a blessing. I will bless you so much that you won't have room enough to contain it that is going to overflow to the people around you. <laughs> see, you see, sometimes you're not the teacup, you're the saucer. And whatever comes on the teacup, if it's overflowing and more than sufficient, is going to come in the saucer. Sometimes you're not the saucer, you're the tablecloth. And if it overflows the tablecloth, it's going to come on the table. Sometimes you're not the tablecloth, you're the table. The other day, my house got flooded. The upper floor flooded. The stairs underneath it flooded. The carpet flooded. It flooded the floor downstairs. That flooded too. The door outside, the water came through it. It flooded on the outside. So the house was blessed. Everything in the house. It's going to be difficult if you are genuinely plugged into this house for you to escape the blessing of God. It's going to be difficult. And God said, I did that in his life. I am the God of Abraham. Because in those days, everybody had gods. And they measured the power of your God by what was happening in your life and how much was happening and how well you were protected. And God said, I'm the one who did that. In, it. in other words, that's my blessing. On his life the Bible says the blessing of the Lord it maketh rich and he adds no sorrow with it doesn't mean the enemy won't attack you doesn't mean some bad things won't attempt to hurt you doesn't mean you won't go through some bad times but the good news is that when the blessing is on you God will take what the enemy meant for evil and he'll make it work for your good doesn't mean it won't hurt you but it won't harm your destiny doesn't mean you won't feel the pain, but the pain isn't going to produce plight. The pain is going to produce purpose. Are you here? The blessing. Antiquity deeply revered the blessing. They took it very seriously. It was most important to them that I must get my father's blessing. I must get it. In Yoruba land, in Igbo land, in most native lands in this country, we understand the importance of having the verbal blessing of your father. For when he speaks, especially in the season of his death, and he conveys what God conveyed to him by words, the same words that caused the blessing to come on him, who caused the blessing to come on you. So the transformation that he benefited from, you become the recipient of that same transformational power. But the boy Esau, he had no value for invisible things, much like this generation. He placed no value on the things that you cannot see with the eye. He lived for the natural. He was carnally driven by his wants, his appetites, his cravings, his proclivities, his predilections. That's what drove the man. He had no spiritual inclination. He was a hunter. He was a hairy man. He was an outdoors man. He, he wasn't the contemplative, reflective sort of personality that weighed spiritual matters in the balance. One day he went out hunting, he came back, and he was hungry. And his brother had been watching him and studying him because his brother obviously had been trained to revert the birthright and to recognize that by tradition, your brother has the right to it. But by prophetic oracle, God spoke to his mother that you will carry the birthright and the blessing. But the father was traditional, the mother was spiritual. Isaac was traditional. Rebecca was spiritual. The mother recognized that the father would not naturally give the blessing to Jacob. But by traditional disposition, he would give it to Esau. 
So she started training the boy. The Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. She drummed it into the boy's head. Whilst material things have their importance, they are not more important than spiritual things. Your father, his grandfather, and his great-grandfather, they produce all kinds of wealth. But take your eyes off that stuff and put your eyes on what created the wealth, not the wealth that was created. Put your eyes on the blessor, not the blessing. Have, have a voracious appetite for things spiritual, not things carnal. Because the carnal or the natural proceed from the spiritual. The visible is created by the invisible. She drummed it into this boy's head. She taught him a desire for spiritual things. So that whilst his brother, who, who nursed and nurtured his desire for natural things, Jacob had a penchant for spiritual things. He understood the importance of spiritual things. As crazy as he was, and boy was he crazy. One day, Esau comes back from the hunt, and he's tired. Obviously, he didn't catch anything. But the thing I like about Jacob... Jacob grew his livestock nearby. Whilst Esau was depleting his livestock by killing them and not reproducing them, Jacob kept reproducing his livestock nearby so that if he ever needed livestock, he didn't have to go far to get it. And Jacob would go out to get his livestock and wasn't sure that he'd get any. He came back from the hunt one day and he had nothing in hand. And he said to his brother, give me that same red stew which meant he had recently eaten it. Yorubas call it ebe, pottage. And you, if you are a Jacob, you have to know how to cook. You got to know how to cook, baby. And by cooking, I'm not necessarily using cooking as the reality. I'm using it as a metaphor. One day I was driving through, I think it was Parkview, and I needed a house to live in, and I couldn't find one. I was about to get evicted from where I live. And, and I drove through Parkview, and I saw all these lovely houses. The thing that came to my mind is, Chai, Jacob has cooked a stew. <laughs> and he wants to collect 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 million. Now he talks in dollars. And there's always an Esau willing to sell his birthright for a temporary fleeting measure of carnal satisfaction. The Bible called Esau a profane man and a fornicator, meaning that he, he, he relished the momentary pleasure of natural satisfaction over eternal gratification. And he said to his brother, Give me that same red stew, lest I die. His brother said, I'll give it to you on one condition. Sell me your birthright. You know what Esau said? He said, what does the birthright mean to me when I'm about to die? He was not about to die. He, he just had appetite. He hadn't even gotten to hunger yet. He interpreted life as natural things whereas life does not consist in paychecks and salaries life does not consist in bread alone man shall not live by paychecks and salaries or bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God he said what does it mean to me when I'm about to die you can have my birthright and in that moment Spiritually and legally, Esau fulfilled the prophecy that God gave Rebekah when she was struggling with two children in her womb. And she asked God, what meaneth this struggle? If I'm blessed, why am I like this? And God said to her, there are two nations, two distinct manner of people in your womb. The older will serve the younger. And in that moment, Jacob took what was his legally. It had not yet been transferred by the father, but Esau had forfeited it because he despised 
the birthright, the Bible says. He despised. There are people in this room, hear me carefully, they despise the blessing. There are many. There are probably some of them sitting beside you. Just do a road check. Say, are you the one he's talking about? Because they will quickly give up the spiritual, the thing that causes the blessing to come upon them. They become rude. They become insubordinate. They become uh, vociferous. They Name it. They attack the thing that God is using to bless them. They despise it. They run away from it. They abandon it. They abdicate it. They cheapen it. But Jacob revered it. And it's not easy to reverse something you can't see. It's not easy. It's not easy to place highest value on something that is invisible. But if everybody's fighting for it and struggling for it and trying to get it, that they wanted to kill the boy who had it, that's why they tried to kill Joseph. Because it was already committed to him. It hadn't yet been transferred, but his father had already said, this is my son, the one in whom I'm well pleased, and that's why I put the coat of many colors on him. Esau despised it. As, as a pastor, I can tell you that most and generally, from my observations, the people who cherish the blessing and have stayed with the blessing over the years, they are the ones who you see the physicality of the blessing without sorrow. There are others who carry a blessing, but it's with sorrow. God can change that today. Hmm. I asked the question, how did Jacob get the blessing? Can I give you a few brief points? Number one, it was his to take. You cannot take what does not belong to you. If the crown is not yours, you can't have it. If the grace is not yours, you can't have it. I can't sing like Sammy, so I'm, I'm not likely, unless he does the song and I throw my name on it, to get a chart buster. But that's one of the things that he has. He can do it if you wake him up at 3 a.m. in the morning, it's going to happen. If he's tired and hasn't slept or eaten for four days, give him a microphone. He's going to do it. Don't give him piano and a compliment. He'll make the piano. Because it's his to do. That's what was given to him. So when the blessing comes on him, it expresses itself in the unique way in which he is called and resultantly gifted. Jacob got the blessing because it was his to take. What do I mean by that? Prophetically, God had already declared that the blessing is not on the firstborn, it's on the lastborn. It's not on the older, it's on the younger. It was his to take. Now, just because it's yours to take doesn't mean there won't be a fight. And the reason why God puts the blessing on you, on you is so that you become empowered to take what is yours from the person who God empowered to hold it till you come? Now, because that thing that you are supposed to take is very desirable to many. He has to use somebody strong to hold it for you so that nobody else will take it until you come. And then when you come, he has to make you more powerful than the fellow who's holding it so you can dispossess him. Some people are going to be dispossessed. In this Nigeria... Some people are about to be dispossessed so that the people to whom it belongs will arise and shine for your light will come and the glory of God's blessing will arise upon you. It was his to take. His mother knew it. His mother trained him for it. She coached him for it and then she helped him. The second reason why Jacob got the, the blessing was because, my friends, 
His brother Esau forfeited the blessing because he despised it for a moment of carnal satisfaction. Look at chapter 25 and verse 29. Genesis 25 and verse 29. And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, because I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this darn thing, what profit shall this birthright do to me? facetiously sarcastically and Jacob said swear to me <laughs> swear to me not tomorrow today and he swore to him and he sold his birthright unto Jacob he said let's go to the lawyer's office I have the food you want I've cooked the stew Jacob you had better learn how to cook because if you don't cook Esau is not gonna come to trade with you yes, sir. and because Esau has the blessing but he also has no respect for the blessing if you don't cook you won't create the opportunity to take what is yours from the person who wrongfully has it because his father is not spiritual but traditional his coach is not spiritual but traditional but your coach That's what the fivefold ministry is. Apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. Spiritual. To teach you spiritual things. Because the father of spiritual things or natural things is spirit. God is the father of all flesh. The reason why he got it, the second reason was because Esau forfeited the blessing. For a moment of pleasure. A moment of natural satisfaction but Jacob was right in place he already had what Jacob wanted and he knew that because Jacob wanted it so bad and that Jacob's value system was so skewed that Jacob would give up the blessing for the stew what stew are you cooking what are you doing with your competence, your ability, your diversities? What are you doing with your your gifts, your abilities, your calling? What are you doing? Jacob have you started opening the shop? Have you started preparing your produce? Have you started preparing your stock? Do you not know that Esau's coming to give you what is rightfully yours and you can't steal it from him? You have to take it legitimately. He has to be the one to give it to you with an oath. Because without an oath, he can take it back. But with an oath, he can never reverse it. What are you cooking? What are you cooking? Ask your neighbor, are you cooking anything? What are you cooking? Do, do, do the people around you see your value? Are you producing value in the economy? Do you not know that the Lagos state economy is bigger than the economy of Kenya and bigger than the economy of 40% if not 50% of African states? And you live in Lagos. Don't play games. Righteousness must fight for Lagos. Lagos must not go to the dogs. The righteous must arise and take what is your birthright. The righteous. People who, will, what does righteous mean? People who will do what is right with the resource, the capacity, the economy, the ability of this land. That God put you on. Did he not tell you that wheresoever the soles of your feet shall tread, I will give it to you. You are in a blessed land. God blessed it because he knew you were coming. And God blesses the land so that whatever you do on the land will be blessed. Can I go a little further? I've given you two points. Two. Can I give you a couple more? Two or three more and then I'll get out of your way. Number three, Jacob had the support and help of somebody who had prophetic understanding of his future. This person taught him about the birthright. 
She knew about the prophetic promise in Genesis 25. She ignited within Jacob a desire for the blessing so that Jacob worked with his life to be able to get the blessing. She informed him of the prophetic promise. The Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. This person who supported and helped him to get the blessing was his mother. God is your father, but the church is your mother. God gives the instructions. The church, the maternity of who you are, enables the instructions, nurtures you. Hear me, the fivefold gifts in the church have the prophetic insight, the prophetic ability, the tutorial ability, the apostolic grace to build you, to inform you, to train you in the things pertinent to the blessing and the birthright. You understand this? I hope you do. This woman, because of what she heard, she knew that at the point nearing her husband's death, that her husband, as was with the tradition, would lay down in his bed and he would sooner or later call for his firstborn son. But there was a problem because that firstborn son had gone and married strange women and that would pollute the line that would carry Messiah. So Jacob, or rather Isaac, was annoyed with his son. That's why he required his son to go into the field and get him that famous savory meat called venison and make him a savory dish so that he would eat it and his soul would revive in its love for his son. And then, bless it, too many people in our generation don't understand how the blessing works. You want a blessing from where you have not sowed. You want a blessing from where you have not triggered, whereas the law is seed time and then harvest. They are not a two different laws, they are one law. Winter and summer, heat and cold, seed time and harvest, it's one law. You can't receive from what you have not supported. I'm amazed at the many who say, that's my church, that's my path. Yet they don't tire, they don't give, they don't support, and they want the blessing. The blessing is yours but you have to trigger it. His mother heard his father call the firstborn and said, go and get me that, that special dish. Go and get me some, how do they say it in Yoruba? Erogbe, antelope, grass cotta. Cook it for me the way we do it. Bring it to me, let me eat it. And then my soul, my emotions, my volition, and my mind will bless you. Esau got up and he ran to the field that he had depleted. He didn't find the livestock quickly. His mother, the, the one who favored Jacob, heard the voice of his father. She quickly called her son. He said, go and get me two of the best kids of the goat. He didn't have to go far. Make sure you don't have to go far for your goats. Make sure you don't have to go far for your stuff. He went, got them quickly. She made them into, into the savory dish. She, the boy said, my dad will curse me if he finds out that I'm lying to him. He said, let your curse be on my head. That's a true spiritual matriarch. To preserve the next generation, she was willing to sacrifice herself. And then she said, don't worry about it. Because he said, my skin is smooth. My brother is hairy. My father will know the difference. He said, don't worry. Give me the skins. She put the skins on him, put the garments of Esau on Jacob, made the dish, and Jacob went into his father. He said, father, here I am. I brought what you sent me to go and get. His father said, are you my very son Esau? Guess what Jacob did? He said, yes, I am. He didn't come in his name. I'm coming. Just hold it right there. Just hold it right there. I'm coming. Because he had support, he was taught how to conduct himself in the presence of the Father. 
He was trained and helped to conduct himself properly in the presence of the Father because he knew that the blessing comes not just from the Father, but through the Father from God. That even if the Father wanted to give it, the Father can't give it unless God releases him to do it. Are you here? He had support. Number one, it was his to take. Number two, his brother forfeited the blessing because he despised it. He was not a spiritual man. Number three, he had the support of somebody who understood his prophetic future and knew how to help him. That's why I can't go to just any kind of church. My preacher has to have prophetic understanding like the sons of Ishakar, who knows the times and is able to set things in order for people to fulfill the times and fulfill the prophetic mandate of God. My lawyer doesn't have to be anointed. My barber doesn't, neither does my dentist. But my preacher, he has to be anointed. Not just anointed to shout, but anointed to educate. Anointed to intimate. Anointed to inform. Can I go a little further? Number four, when he got into his father, he put on the nature and appearance of the firstborn. Because the blessing could not go to anybody else but the firstborn. And when he entered into his father, the Bible said his father discerned him not. Hey! God of Israel. I like this Bible. I love the Bible. His father discerned him not. Because when he got into his father, he said, This is the voice of Jacob. Come closer. And he felt him, but it is the hand of Esau. When he felt the hand, he was convinced that though he sounds like Jacob, this is really the one to whom I meant to give it to. It's Esau. Are you here? Number five, I'm ending here. He came in the name of the older brother. Esau asked him, asked Jacob, what is your name? He said, Esau. My friends, in John 14, John 15 and John 16, time forbids me. In the last words of Jesus Christ as he discoursed with the disciples before he went to the cross, he said to them, three different occasions, hitherto you have not asked the Father anything in my name. But from henceforth, you ask him anything in my name, the Father will do it, another place, I will do it, that your fruit may remain to the glory of the Father. You understand? I'll give you the scriptures in a moment. In other words, I had to ask God, Antifosho, why did you allow a lie to prefigure how we are to come to the Father in the name of Christ? <laughs> because if you're going to get the blessing, you're going to get it because you asked for it from the Father. But technically, you have no right to it. Because you are not the firstborn. The firstborn, the older brother, is Jesus Christ. And the inheritance of the blessing belongs to him. But being a good older brother and a good firstborn, in Yoruba we call him Dawodu, or in Igbo, Diokpa, that is one who shares the blessing. For the, the writer of the scripture, Apostle Paul said, we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ hear me so when you come to the father you cannot come to the father wearing your own name or wearing your own clothes you put off your former conduct which is according to the flesh and then you put on Christ so that when you walk into the father's presence the father can't see you the father can't see your name he can't identify you he sees his son so that the bad boy looks like the good boy so that the black sheep looks like the white sheep and when he comes into the father's presence the father is not sure because there's some traits of where you were and who you used to be he said this is the voice of Jacob but no, this is the hand of Esau. 
And because I've committed to give my blessing to the firstborn, I'm going to bless you anyway. The father ate the meal. He licked his lips. That's why you got to know how to cook, Jacob. Because if he don't believe you, he got to believe your stew. By stew, it's the kind of thing that Sammy does when he comes and worships. It's the kind of thing that Gloria does. It's the kind of thing that Onos did this, this morning. It's the kind of thing that, 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 that Eno does. That's stew. It's the kind of thing that I'm doing now, setting up the rock cathedral, setting up the admin, setting up the system, building the structure, getting the place ready so that when God comes to the table, he has a feast of the praise, the worship, the prayer, the sincerity, the tenacity, the resilience of his people in concerted symphony. So that when he eats it, he, he looks and says, let me bless that boy. Because if I bless him, he's going to make me more stew. And then I, I, I'll eat the stew, I'll bless him some more. Then, then, then he'll make more stew, that'll be better, then I'll bless him some more. And it becomes not a vicious cycle, but a fortuitous or a virtuous cycle. You hear what I'm saying? So you ask me, Pastor, how am I going to get this blessing on my life? Go with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10. Not verse 9, give me verse 10 first. 1 Chronicles chapter 4, and I'm going to end on this note. There was a boy by the name of Jabez. His mother had several children, and her life was painfully sorrowful. It was grievous to her. And he was the climax of it all because when he was born, she was at the climax of her pain. And she named him according to her circumstances. Don't define, or rather don't make a permanent decision on a temporary situation. And Jabez, after his name was called pain, you cause pain, you are a pain maker. You make me sorry, you make me sorrowful. Can you imagine that's what they call you every day? Pain, come here. Pain, sit down. Pain, take your bag and go to school. Pain, pain, pain. After he was exasperated, he called on the God of Jacob. That's what Israel means. Saying, oh, that thou wouldest bless me. Indeed. And enlarge my territory, that thine hand might be with me, and that thou would escape me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. He said, God bless me. That's why I came here this morning, so that you could go to your God. In spite of your circumstance, your turmoil, your trouble, your travail, the inconsistencies and the contradictions and the conflicts in your life. Say, God, if anybody can turn it around, it's only you. Bless me. Bless me. I don't want to cause pain. Give me verse 9. I don't want to cause pain. In answer to his prayer, this was the result. And Jabez was more honorable than everybody in his family. God took the least likely, the worst, and he made them the best. That's what the blessing is about to do to somebody. Amen. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 14. It is by faith. Give me that. Galatians 3, 14. It's by faith that the blessing of Abraham comes upon the Gentiles through faith in Jesus Christ. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. There's a blessing here. That blessing has already raised several men. They haven't even gone the half of where God is taking them to. Several women. That blessing is what took me from the back streets of South Miami. Took a gentleman I know from the floor of Falamo Shopping Center. Took several people in this room. I could start enumerating and giving you their testimonies. And that blessing has been raising. I'm not saying they didn't have battles or struggles or fights. But the blessing will bring you through. Just like it brought Abraham through. I want you to rise to your feet and you're going to take the next five minutes. This is not between you and your neighbor. This is you. Especially those of you who are in trouble right now. Especially those of you who are in a hell hole right now. 
Five things. It was his to take. The blessing belongs to you. His brother forfeited it. Because he despised spiritual things. I believe you are a spiritual person. Perhaps that's why you're here this morning. He had the support of his mother. Who had prophetic understanding of his future. Number four. Somebody help me. He came in the name of his older brother. And he put on the nature and appearance of the older brother. See, one of the problems with the legalistic church is the legalistic church wants to come to God and say, God, give me a blessing because I'm a good boy. Give me a blessing because I ate my conflicts, I said my prayers, I didn't do what was wrong. But God does not accept those kind of prayers. Not that he wants you to have license for evil, but there's no righteousness of man that qualifies for the presence of God. All of your righteousness, the Bible says, is as filthy rags. There's only one righteousness that he respects. That's the righteousness of the one who died on the cross of Calvary. That's the only one who will get the blessing from the Father. But he says, if you will put on Christ and wear the apparel, the nature of the firstborn, Jesus Christ, and you come to the Father, not in your name, but in the name of the firstborn. Everything you ask the Father, he said, I will give it. There's only one thing I want you to ask, because everything is in that one thing. Put off your former conversation and your former conduct, which was fashioned according to your former lusts, and put on Christ. Step into Christ. The Bible tells you that you are hid in Christ in God. Every blessing you're ever going to get is going to be in Christ. Step into him fully, affirmatively. It's your right. It's your positioning. But I want you to step into it and I want you to come to the Father in his name, in his apparel. And the Father will say, but that is the voice of Tolu. That is the voice of Tokwe. That is the voice of Tokumbo. No, I'm, I'm coming in Jesus' name. Say, come a little closer. Let me feel you. When he feels you, what garments are you wearing? Are you so convinced that in Christ you have everything? If you are, you'll step into him. That's where the blessing is. I want you to start talking to him and tell God, I don't want to cause pain anymore. Bless me indeed. Keep, keep 1 Chronicles 4 and verse 10 on the screen for me. Go ahead, talk to him. Some of you had better open your heart and open your mouth. Because if you don't get this blessing on you, with what the enemy is trying to use to kill you, destroy you, ruin you, get this blessing on you. God knew that the bad boy Jacob would become the good boy Israel. Because there's just something about the bad boy in his badness that makes him bad that if God gets hold of it the same thing that made him bad will make him very good for the purposes of God because whenever he does anything he does it to the extreme come on choir help me to sing that song I want you to open up your mouth if you want to come to the altar this altar is blessed open up your mouth something has to change in your life that cycle of debt has to change. That cycle of sickness, that cycle of attack, that cycle of cursings, that cycle of defeat and failure, it has to change. It has to change today. This is the day you come into the Father's house, into the Father's chamber, and ask the Father's blessing in the name of the firstborn to come upon you. Men, women, Boys, girls, children, elders, oldest, this is your moment to come into the Father's house. Thank you for making our time to listen to this message. For additional information of this and other ministry products by Pastor Paul Adefarsen, please contact us on 01-461-4120 or 01-461-4135 or by email 
to info at houseontherock.org.ng. You can also visit our website on www.houseontherock.org.ng. God bless you.